Hi there, I'm Minister Leah Allen, and I want to welcome you to Virginia Highland Church, where Black lives matter, where women's rights are human rights, where children are seen and heard, where no human is illegal, where we are mindful that our church sits on land stolen from First Nation peoples. Welcome to a church where love is love, where people of all abilities and all faiths are our siblings. Our mission at Virginia Highland Church is to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. I want to extend a very special welcome to our first time visitors watching online. And if you're returning for worship or you've been with our congregation for a long time, welcome home. Today's the third Sunday of Easter where we are continuing to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, wherever you're watching or listening, please join us in singing this opening hymn of praise. Welcome. come before God during our time of honesty. Living God, long ago faithful women proclaimed the good news of Jesus' res resurrection and were not believed. Today we confess our own slowness of heart. We have failed to believe the witness of your siblings who proclaim truth from the margins of society. Santo Espírito de Dios, ven sobre mí. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Teach us, holy God, to keep faith in the women, that our witness may be as bold, our love as deep, and our faith as true. Even in our pain and grief, help us to recognize the resurrected Christ in the testimony of your people. Siblings, God invites us to believe the women at the empty tomb, 
to share the witness of the beloved community, and to accept with grace the truth and beauty of the resurrection. We are the church, an Easter people. Thanks be to God. This message is especially for our youngest saints, but this is Virginia Highland Church, so everyone is welcome to play. Kids, I want you to get a little closer. Come on, get close to the screen. I want to show you something magical. Take a look at this image. It's kind of blotchy, not too sure what or who this is, but we're going to do something really cool and amazing with this. You will notice four small dots in the center. Do you see those four small dots? I want you to stare at those dots for 30 seconds. Ready, set, go. Stare, stare, stare. Don't look away, don't look away. Blinking's okay, but not too much. Keep looking, keep staring, keep looking. Just focus on the four dots, only the four dots. We are looking, we are looking at those four lovely dots in the middle. Keep going, keep going. Almost there, keep looking, keep staring. Just a few more seconds. Keep going until I say, Okay, now, real quick, look up at the ceiling, blink a couple of times, what or who do you see? Isn't that amazing? Do you see an image of Jesus? In today's Bible story, we're going to hear about some people who also got a surprise glimpse of Jesus when they didn't expect to see him. It's a good reminder that God can appear at any time, anywhere, so best to keep your eyes open. Okay, the magic has probably worn off, but you can go back and look at it again later. For now, let's pray. God, help me to see and recognize your face everywhere. Amen. Fearless is how Charles Johnson describes his wife, Kira. I love you. We're talking about a woman that was a marathon runner, that raced cars, that was a skydiver. It never occurred to him that the greatest danger Kira would face would be going to one of the best hospitals in California to have a baby, their second son, Langston. Hey, Mom. Hi, Daddy. Hey, Langston. Hey, Langston. I've been waiting on you, buddy. The first sign of a problem came in the late afternoon of April 12, 2016, shortly after Kira gave birth. I was sitting by Kira's bedside, and I began to notice the catheter turn pink with blood. A doctor ordered a CT scan, a CAT scan. Johnson says he didn't worry at first. Something's not quite right, and I was aware of that, but we've got a plan. And she's in what I thought were great hands. And how's Kara feeling during this? Lethargic. I'm continuing to advocate and ask more adamantly, look, when are we taking her for the CT scan? Well, seven o'clock rolls around, eight o'clock goes by, nine o'clock comes, 10 o'clock comes. There's still There's no CT. There's still no CT scan. Shortly after midnight, his wife was taken into surgery. She's holding my hand and she's saying that she was scared. And I'm telling her that everything's gonna be okay. Everything's gonna be okay. And that was the last time I saw my wife alive. When they took Kira back to surgery, there were three and a half liters of blood in her abdomen. And she coded immediately. And when you say code, she died. Her heart stopped immediately. Kira Johnson was 39 years old. And her death isn't just a personal tragedy. 
she's part of a disturbing national trend. Dr. Marianne Etiobet is executive director of Merck for Mothers, a program run by the pharmaceutical giant Merck to reduce the number of maternal deaths throughout the world. She never guessed that one of the countries most in need was the U.S. 60% of the deaths in the United States are preventable. And where do we compare to other developed countries like Great Britain, Canada? The United States is ranked 46th when it comes to maternal mortality. Amber McLaughlin was 29 years old and eight months pregnant when she began to feel an excruciating pain that would come and go. She says her doctor wasn't alarmed. They're telling you, no, don't come in. We've yep. seen you. You're fine. They told me that, to go home and rest. They said, you're 35 weeks. You're probably uncomfortable. Go home and rest. And I said, I'm not going home. I'm coming in today. Even then, a nurse practitioner hesitated and then relented, sending McLaughlin for tests. I get hooked up to the monitors and a few minutes, I mean, it felt like two, they came rushing in and they said, where's your husband? This baby has to be out in 10 minutes. She had developed a rare condition that caused her blood pressure to skyrocket, putting both her life and her baby's at risk. I'm thinking to myself, I was right this whole time. Why has it come to this? And so at that moment, I, it's even at five years later, it's one of those things that when nobody believes you. Dr. Neil Shaw is a professor of obstetrics at Harvard Medical School. The pain is okay? And a practicing physician. Are you also saying that some of these C-sections are just not necessary? Probably more than half of them. And when complications do arise, says Dr. Shaw, doctors don't always listen to their pregnant patients. I think there is a dimension of gender discrimination. If a woman after a birth goes into a hospital with concerning signs of a complication, there are no rules for how quickly an obstetrician has to see her. And in fact, it's a routine case that it'll take hours. And statistics indicate that it may not just be gender that plays a part in dangerous delays, but also race. If you're a woman of color in this country, especially if you're black, your odds of dying in childbirth are three to four times higher on average in our country. Why? Because you're not talking about access to health care. You're not talking about money or education. No, and this is going to be hard to hear. We believe black women less when they express concerns about the symptoms they're having, particularly around pain. And that's the common thread in all the stories we've been hearing in the media, including Serena Williams. Yes, even Serena Williams, the world-class athlete who developed a pulmonary embolism after giving birth to her daughter last September. We had a lot of complications, but look who we got. She says that had she not insisted on receiving a CAT scan, she could have died. We're leaving the hospital after seven days, six yeah. days. It's been a long time. Listen to the word. Listen to the word that God has spoken. Listen to the one who is close at hand. Listen to the voice that began creation. Listen even if you don't Chapter 24, verses 13 through 32. We listen for God's word in these words. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened while they were talking and discussing. Jesus came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him and he said to them what are you discussing with each other while you walk along they stood still looking sad then one of them whose name was Calypso, answered are you the only stranger in jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days what things the things about jesus of nazareth who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before god and all the people and how our chiefs, priests, and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. 
Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that Jesus was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into glory? They begin with Moses and all the prophet he inter interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scripture. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead to go on, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he looked, took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to, to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and Jesus vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? Here is this ancient witness from yesterday. May, May the, the word, word become, become flesh in us today. today. Friends, please pray with me. God, in this hour, in this moment, help us to say yes to the move of your spirit and open our hearts to receive now what it is you have to say. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us. Amen. Well, in our modern lesson, we heard about some of the disparities and discrimination in the medical treatment of women, particularly black women and women of color. As one doctor pointed out, there is an implicit bias at work in how black women are treated by doctors and healthcare providers who assume oftentimes that they have a higher threshold of pain than others. While this is certainly not always the case, and while I am personally immensely grateful for the many nurses and doctors who fight to save and protect lives, I'm aware that the healthcare system is a system and that the medical industrial complex is a very real thing. Those of us who have been studying and working as we are at Virginia Highland Church in anti-racism and anti-oppression know that this is rooted in history where enslaved African women were thought of as animals who could bear the brunt and weight of severe physical pain, including giving birth to several children and performing back-breaking labor. In several research studies and procedures, Black women's bodies were, and in some countries still are, experimented upon without consent or agency. When the test subjects, as they were referred to, would complain of complications, doctors ignored them. When some women came forward years later, their stories were not immediately believed. 
I watched my partner endure a similar struggle over the last few weeks as she advocated fiercely for her mother who recently died from pneumonia and COVID-19 related complications. Not long after she was admitted, she noticed that her mother's breathing was worsening and tried to tell every nurse and doctor who would listen that something was not right. It took almost two days before one of the nurse supervisors would stop to listen to my partner explain that her mom's health was not improving. That's when the doctors began testing for coronavirus and placed her on a ventilator, life support. While she was not able to survive the pneumonia, and while several of the hospital staff were diligent in their care, there is no doubt in my mind that my partner's mom would have suffered tremendously were it not for the voice of her daughter fighting and advocating on her behalf. In the world of our gospel text found in Luke chapter 24, believing women was countercultural. So we shouldn't be too surprised at the reaction of the male disciples when Mary, mother of James, Mary Magdalene, and Joanna, and other women who were first at the tomb, ran back to tell the disciples about their encounter with a few angels and the prophetic vision given to them about Jesus's resurrection. In some ways, not all, these women would have been viewed and treated as second class and third class citizens. For one, they were following Jesus. This would have been a provocative considering their status among the other disciples, the chief priests, etc., and the radical message which Jesus preached. And what about Mary Magdalene? No doubt her reputation among men and women preceded her and would have made her testimony questionable at best. Third, the disciples weren't the biggest fans of women. They didn't always like or even understand why Jesus treated women differently or made it a point to spend time with them, especially women of ill repute. We should keep in mind that these were the same women whose money and offerings and gifts funded Jesus's ministry and provided for the disciples themselves. So while there were question marks behind their association with Jesus, there were men and likely many families whose lives depended on the generosity of women. These were women who I believe were both ethnically and ontologically black, meaning that because of their lived experience, they could be seen as identifying with blackness. Black women are often viewed and treated as the lowest in our societies. They're often undervalued and not believed. What's both sad and intriguing about what happened is that while these women were still in pain and grief, they spoke their truth anyways. What's more sad, however, is that they weren't believed. Black women today face so many hardships in speaking their truth. The truth is that we live in a society skewed toward not believing black women, their pain, their grief, their stories. Not only that, but those in influence and power and authority have continued to make black women out to be unbelievable. We've seen it when black women speak out against sexual assault and boldly proclaim me too and their testimonies are silenced. We see it every day in the way President Trump treats women like Congresswoman Maxine Waters or journalist Yamish Alcindor when he tells them to shut up, stop acting threatening or be nice when they point out one of his many, many lies. And just this week, those of us in Georgia saw it in the way Governor Kemp dismissed Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms and her authority to lead during this pandemic. Time and time again, black women are not believed and their witness is not taken seriously. While the disciples were too stricken by grief, the text says that they were even brought to dissension as they argued over the news the women brought back 
of Jesus's resurrection. This was cause for Jesus himself on the road to Emmaus to remind them of the words of the prophets and what had been written long ago. And in some ways, I believe, to assure them that Mary, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and the other women weren't making their story up. That they had seen and heard and felt and experienced and that it was real. That the disciples should believe. The good news is that despite the obstacles to bearing witness, these women went back anyways and shared the truth of the gospel to a group of men who didn't believe them. They were faithful. And the very good news is that the disbelief of a few didn't hinder the message of the resurrection from reaching far and beyond the disciples. Because of faithful women who heard and responded to the call to share the gospel, news of the resurrection spread far and wide and those who believed were blessed. So what is our charge today? When women speak their truth, believe them. Believe black women. We should all pause before refusing to hear a black woman's testimony or taking her words as threatening or confrontational. We should practice living lives that honor the sacred truth of black women, whether that means showing up for them when their story isn't heard or believed, showing solidarity with a neighbor or friend who needs to speak a hard truth, or simply listening to black women and other marginalized folk before casting judgment. This wasn't easy for the disciples to do, but their story, she set an example for all of us. Believing women was and still is countercultural. Then again, so was following Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us now come together for the prayer of the church. God of fierce presence, you have created us with a divine breath. You inhabit this darkness, brood over our abyss, and speak to the chaos around us. You have called us by our names and invited us to be here at this time, to be a community. Right now, maybe more than ever. May we do this so humbly in your name. We echo the concerns for others from the prayer for the lips of prophets. And so we pray these things. We pray for those who are weary of sharing their pain. Who speak but are not heard whose stories began centuries ago, whose testimonies are deemed a false witness, those who have nowhere to turn for rest, who refuse to be silenced, who whisper tenderly and knowingly to their kin, who shout a holy protest to their oppressors, 
who wonder if there's any point. Who cannot keep truth to themselves. Who wail for all that has been lost. And for those who sing for all that we might become. Those who call others to rise and those whose voices reach out like open arms for the hurting. We not only recognize God's healing work, we recognize the ways in which we might help heal each other. May we be nourished in body and soul. May community uphold us. And so as we go forth into the blur of the horizons, we trust that God is here every step of the way. And in this trust, we say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Mother, Father, Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hi, VHC. I wish today we were together in person because today is my last day as a pastoral intern with you all. I have so appreciated being able to learn from this congregation over the past year. It has been a wonderful opportunity to explore how to do ministry in just so many different areas. I want to thank the staff especially Matt for being a great mentor and for Juliana as my fellow intern as we explored how to be pastoral interns at BHC. I am so grateful to this congregation for all the love and support they've given me and all the love and support I've seen you all give each other, um, particularly in these past few months. I'm also particularly grateful to those who worked with me as we tried out small groups. I had a great time getting to know those in the groups much more closely, um, and I really enjoyed learning how to plan those and being a part of that. I attended VHC before this internship, and I plan to continue attending once I return to Emory in the fall. Hopefully we will be back together by then, but if not, I hope to still continue in this community. Um, and I will continue doing uh, music with the Musician Circle. And thanks to the Musician Circle too for being such a great part of this year. So I hope to keep seeing you, getting to know you, and um, learning from this really lovely community. Thank you all again so much for giving me such a kind, warm place to grow in my work this year. Thank you, Shelby, for sharing all of your gifts with us over this past year. Shelby has been a delight to work with and have as a part of our team. It's sad to see her go, but good to know she will still be a part of the congregation, including as a part of our music ministry. For many years, VHC had exactly zero interns until last year when Reverend Claudia laid the groundwork with local seminaries, which resulted in exponential growth from zero to two interns. Shelby concludes today, and Juliana is with us for two more Sundays, concluding on May 10th. The church will be making a gift to each of them, but please feel free to express your own words of gratitude to Juliana at vhchurch.org or Shelby at vhchurch.org and share how you've witnessed them grow as pastors. And now we have an opportunity to share our gifts as we pass the virtual offering plate, which is just as important as the physical one we would pass in the sanctuary. And there are three ways to give today. First, 
through the website and you can scan the QR code to become a one-time or a regular giver or you can give through Venmo and remember 10% of all gifts given to VHC through Venmo in April will be given to the Giving Kitchen which supports restaurant workers laid off during the pandemic. You can also send a check to the church at the address shown here. However you choose to give today, your generosity matters and is so appreciated. Let's do that now, even as we receive this gift of music. I truly hope that you have enjoyed this worship experience as we continue to celebrate the good news that Jesus is risen and risen indeed. Now, go forth into a world that is so often unjust. And remember, believe women, believe black women, believe those who sit at the margins of society and witness to the truth of the gospel. Theirs too is the kingdom of God. Go in peace. God bless. And God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. Yes, God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy.